it could be dynamic due to rain and such? Um, well, when it comes to soil pressure here, we have certain load combination for it. So uh, as I was saying here, that uh, in this course, again, he's just interested in designing the stem itself. I'm gonna show you here the loads and what's gonna happen with it. So this actually, it is not a dead load. It is not life load. It is gonna be soil pressure load. And in the code, we use the term H for it. So H uppercase is gonna be used for soil. D is gonna be for dead load and L is gonna be for life load. The stability of the wall itself is not gonna be our concern for this um, course, but you need to understand that the two possible modes of failure, I mean, if you like here to be sure that this wall is stable, this give you the question, right? So what do you need to do? You're gonna say, I wanna be sure that it doesn't slide, which means when the pressure is pushing it, the entire wall is not gonna be moving here left, right? I don't want this to happen, we call the sliding, or it's gonna be overturning, which means all of a sudden you see the entire wall is lifting up and just collapsing this way, right? So you don't want both of these two to happen. And also we want to be sure that the soil pressure below the footing is within the allowable soil pressure. I'm not gonna be doing this, but you have, this gave you just for reading, if you like, this gave you the possible mode of failure for the wall itself, for the entire thing wall. In this course, I'm gonna be interested more into the design of this structural element, which is this retaining wall. Different types of retaining walls, and we have gone through this already. This is when you have prefab, which means prefabricated. This give you like precast wall, you know? Same thing, precast wall, prefabricated. This give you cast in place. They do the form work. As you see here, the forms are setting aside. And then the, do you put some snap ties, certain connections here between the two sides of the form work. Do you pull it from the top? Of course, you're gonna have here tons of reinforcing. And then after that, they strip the wall. They strip the wall, they take the, uh, the form is out. And with that, you're gonna have this shape of concrete wall. Later on, they're gonna come and fill this with soil. It's not gonna stay like this, right? They're gonna fill this in soil and they're gonna compact it. Now, the type of lateral pressure that you're expecting here is gonna be three types of soil pressures. The first one here is called the thrust. A thrust is gonna happen, here's the wall and the wall is not moving. The wall is gonna be AB. The other type of walls is gonna be called active pressure case. Active pressure case is gonna happen when the wall is gonna start to rotate a little bit. So you're gonna start here at A, B, and then after this, after a little bit, it's gonna be at A prime B. This little bit I'm talking about, it could be maybe a few years. So it is not like 10 minutes. It's gonna be after a few years, the wall is gonna start to rotate a little bit. This is gonna happen only in cantilever walls, in this type of walls, like this wall here, after let's say a few years, you may see here um, that this wall is gonna start to come out. It's gonna start to loosen a little bit. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you should expect to see it, but what I'm saying is when the wall is gonna start to give in, which means start to rotate a little bit, uh, the pressure is gonna be reduced from the behind of the wall, like in this case here, if you put some soil, and let's say after five or six years, uh, you're gonna start here to see maybe a hair crack in the top of the soil. You understand that the wall is gonna start to give uh, uh, its strength a little bit. And in this case, we're gonna say that we have active soil pressure. Passive soil pressure is gonna happen actually at the bottom of the wall. If I may take you back here, it's gonna happen here at the bottom. So the blue arrow here, we're like in here, this gonna be the passive pressure because actually this active pressure, it is true, it's gonna be higher in terms of the total value and it's gonna be pushing the wall against the other soil. So in that case, this pressure here is gonna be a little bit high in the intensity only. What do I mean by the intensity? Which means the pressure itself is gonna be high, but because the height is small, the total pressure coming from the right side is gonna be more than the pressure coming from the left side. So we call this passive pressure. Passive pressure is gonna happen when you push the wall against the soil. Now let's look at the other variables that we have here. I'm taking here a soil sample or a soil element and the side of this gonna be one by one. So it could be one inch by one inch or one foot by one foot. Here's the soil element in the three cases I have. It's gonna be taken at depth edge. You see here, depth edge, edge and edge. So it's gonna be the same soil element. The vertical pressure, and we're gonna call it here the effect pressure if you like. If you have been taking here soil mechanics or foundation design, you should be exposed to sigma V prime. 
it's going to be equal to the vertical pressure. Vertical pressure, usually, as you know, the vertical pressure is going to be equal to what? Can someone help me? Anyone's taking soil um, mechanics or foundation design? Matthew? Yeah, Are you talking for Alexis? I cannot hear you guys. Uh, can you hear me now? No. <laughs> Sorry, but um, something maybe with your connection or it could be with uh, the microphone. Adolfo, can you help me with this? Yes. Have you taken any soil mechanics um, courses? Yes, took soil mechanics last semester. Okay, good. Do you remember how much is this vertical pressure? How do you do the, here the vertical pressure of the sign? Not really? I, I don't really remember. Well, okay. All right. This is fine. No worries. Um, so let me get here and explain this a little bit more. This vertical pressure is going to be equal to the unit weight of the soil times the height. So usually it's going to be equal to gamma times h. Gamma is going to be the unit weight of the soil times the height, this h. So this sigma v prime is going to be equal to gamma times h. How about here? Same thing, gamma times h. How about here? It's going to be the same thing, gamma times h. So vertical pressure is going to be the same. It is actually equal to the unit weight of the soil multiplied by this height. And it's going to be in PSF. Why in PSF? Because unit weight, the gamma is going to be in, in what? What units do you use here for the unit weight of the soil? PCF. PCF, cubic foot per, or pound per cubic foot, right? So in this case, you multiply by H, which is in feet, is going to be pound per square feet. Now, the horizontal pressure, and this is what I'm interested in because I'm going to be designing this wall for this moment at the bottom, right? Because if you imagine that you push the wall in this way, with some forces, what's going to happen? You're going to be creating a moment at the base. And the moment is going to be equal to this force multiplied by the height, by this height, or the moment R. So the horizontal pressure is going to be equal to the vertical pressure. Look at this equation. This sigma V prime, right, multiplied by K sub zero is going to give you the horizontal pressure. But in this case, because we call this at rest, this factor is going to be K sub zero. When you have an active case, this is going to be equal to K factor, but it's going to be K active. And for passive, it's going to be K passive. So the vertical pressure in all of these cases is going to be the same. What's going to be different here is going to be K0, K active, and K passive. Three different factors. When you have water, if you just imagine that this is like a water tank, so let's stay, stay away here from the soil, right? If this would have been filled with water here, how much is the K factor do you think is going to be? Ramin, can you help me with this? Actually, K factor is, uh, as I remember, is one minus sine phi, something okay. like that. This is great. But what I'm saying, if you have water, if we have just filled this with water here, if you have water tank, right? So we, so do, we have to just multiply the unit weight of water to that H. Okay. Now so this can give you the vertical pressure. How about the horizontal pressure? I'm just asked for the K factor. If I have a case like a water tank, what K factor do you expect? Uh, for water, K is equal to one. Great, great. Why? Can you explain this to us, please? Uh, water is kind of isotropic uh, for the okay. pressure. All right. And because of water, we have something that we call hydrostatic pressure. If you remember on hydrostatic pressure, if you have taken fluid mechanics or hydraulics, water pressure is going to be the same in all directions. You remember this statement? So they say, if you have water pressure here, the water pressure in the horizontal direction is going to be the same as the vertical direction, same as any direction, right? They say, if you have water, this water pressure is going to be equal to the same, which is equal to gamma times H. Meaning the K factor, if you have a case of water, is going to be equal to 1.0. And what is the reason of this? Because the water viscosity is very small. So the friction between the water particles is almost nothing. We just ignore it. 
So when we ignore it, we say vertical pressure is gonna be the same as horizontal pressure. In soil, it's completely different because in soil, you have good shear resistance between the soil particles. So if you put a pile of soil here, just imagine that you put here a pile of soil. Do you think it's gonna stay? I mean, let's say that I'm gonna come here on the side, I'm gonna put here some soil. Do you think it's gonna do something like this? Or it's gonna be almost flat like in water. Just imagine that you have a flat surface and then you start here to put water. How high the water is gonna be? The water is gonna be like this, right? It's gonna be almost flat because the water does not, doesn't have any resistance, right? So water is gonna just, it's gonna be flat. You put some water on the table and let's say that you bring a glass of water, right? You put it on the table, it's not gonna stay in the shape of the glass. It's gonna be flat at the end. It's gonna be a thin sheet of water. It doesn't have any resistance right, or any viscosity. Viscosity means the shear resistance, right? It is very low. But if you bring some soil and you put them, you can create a pile, which means in soil, you have some resistance, internal resistance for the soil to stay as is. This is the reason that K sub zero and K active is gonna be less than one for soil, while for water is gonna be equal to 1.0 because the water is gonna stay as flat. Does it make sense? Or do we need to go through this a little bit more? Alfred, are you there? Makes sense. Yeah, Alfred, can you help me with this? Yes. Uh, am I clear on the discussion of vertical pressure versus horizontal pressure? Um, yes. So in a case like this active pressure, which one is higher, the vertical or horizontal? Um. The, the horizontal or the hmm. why is it? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't been uh, really. All right. So okay, it seems that you're not given enough attention here, which is is give you your choice, my friend. Uh -huh. Um, if you stay, please focus with us. Um. Well, guys, we're going to go here through the, the midterm. And uh, unfortunately, some of you, they don't really give enough attention. And um, I don't like it when the score is not really good, but it is your choice. It is not my choice. So um, we're trying here to find out the equation for the at rest soil pressure, the active soil pressure. And then we say it's going to be equal to gamma times H. And if you recall, gamma times H is gonna be the vertical pressure, right? Like what we discussed here is gonna be sigma V prime, multiplied by some coefficient, this K factor. And this K factor, if you may come here, I wanna show this for quick. This K factor, it is for most soil, I'm gonna put here some generic values. You can say here K active. If you don't know much about the soil, you say K active is gonna be equal to one third, right? And K sub zero, I'm gonna put here O, right? It's going to be equal to roughly 0.5, one half, just so you know. K passive is going to be maybe three. So I'm going to say K passive because K passive is equal to the inverse of K active is going to be equal to three. This is like some typical values. If I don't know anything about the soil yet, I'm going to assume here that the angle of internal friction, the phi angle, if you have taken here before soil mechanics or foundation design, usually and the phi angle which is the angle of internal friction, is gonna be roughly equal to 30 degrees. If this is the case, this gonna be like the typical values that you can use. But usually in soil reports, they don't give it to us this way. So if you're doing an actual design and you have a soil report, geotechnical report, this is what you're gonna be getting. Let me just jump to it and I'm gonna come back. In one example, it says a vertical, uh, the following concrete retaining wall design parameters are given the geotechnical report. Lateral earth pressure. It says, if you are doing a restrained wall, what is restrained wall? I'm gonna say, which means at rest. And this happens when you have a pavement wall. If you have unrestrained wall, which is a cantilever wall, they say the soil lateral pressure is gonna be equal to 35 pound per cubic foot for level backfill. So instead of using the K factor. Professor. Yes. 
Uh, you said that a restrained wall is a wall that's like in a basement? Yeah, like a trust. Oh, okay, got yeah. it. Thank you. Unrestrained is going to be like the cantilever one. I just want to show you here different way of doing it that it is not really going to be usually the K active, K passive, and K sub zero. So in this example, it is given as the values that which is typically used in geotechnical report in industry. So in business, actually, they don't give us K active, K passive, and K sub zero. They give us values like this. So why do I show you this? Because you need to understand where is this coming from. We need to connect between the soil mechanics courses that you have taken and between our design for this um, stem or this retaining wall. You need to know where's the connection coming from. So what happened? The soil engineer, instead of giving you this K active and K sub zero and K passive, and instead, they just give you this value here this piece of zero, they give you this value right away. Or they give you this value, gamma times K active. So if you take this gamma, if I may take this here, right? And then multiply by K active, you're gonna get a factor, right? All what you need to know is just the height of the wall. You see the equation, gamma H is what? The vertical pressure. Multiply by this factor to find out the horizontal pressure. This is like the, I don't wanna say scientific way, but this is like, um, what the soil engineer is going to be doing, right? Is going to be figuring out K active based on the equation that you guys have studied in soil mechanics course, multiplied by the unit weight of the soil. Now he's going to be taking this K active times gamma and just give it to you as in one value. And they call this hydrostatic pressure value for the soil pressure. I'm going to be showing this to you in a minute from now. So all what you need to do is just to have the edge height. I said, okay. Once you have here the pressure, so you can draw here the pressure distribution. As you know, right on the top here, pressure is going to be equal to zero because the height is going to be equal to zero. Let's go back here. The height is going to be that depth of the soil measured from the top, which means if you take the soil element right on the top, the height is going to be equal to zero. When you go all the way down, now you are maximizing the height. You are increasing the height. So you're going to see here, H, times gamma times G active is gonna get you the soil lateral pressure. So when H is gonna be small, like equal to zero, soil pressure is gonna be equal to zero. When the H is gonna be going to the maximum height of the retaining wall, the, the pressure here is gonna be equals to max. Therefore, I'm expecting triangular distribution for the soil pressure. At the bottom, the pressure is gonna be equal to gamma, which is the unit weight of the soil times the height of the wall times K, the coefficient, right? If you have this triangular distribution, you should be able to find out the lateral force. This is giving now the horizontal force that you have on the wall. This horizontal force is gonna be equal to the integration of this triangular distribution of the stress. So it's gonna be equal to what? This F, the force, total force, is gonna be equal to the base of the pressure, applied by the height, applied by the width, divided by two, which means it's gonna be the area of this triangular distribution applied by one foot perpendicular to the screen. So in this case, I'm going to say F is going to be equal to P, the pressure at the bottom, times H, divided by 2. You're going to say, where is this one perpendicular to this? I'm going to say it is not used because it's going to be for one foot. I'm going to be taking here a strip of one foot of the wall and just work on it. Now, when you have your triangular distribution, where is going to be the CG of it? Where is the force is going to be located at? I'm going to say it's going to be located at one third of the height. This gave me the CG of this triangular distribution of the stress. So, okay. Therefore, if you like here to take the moment about the base, the moments gave me equal to the force F multiplied by the moment R, F H divided by three. Now, this explains where the force is coming from, lateral force, and where is the moments gave me coming from. How do you figure out the moment? So, my goal in this course here, that you're going to be able to figure out the force based on this pressure distribution, multiplied by this height, the moment R. And once you find the moment, the rest of the analysis can be the same as if you are having here a rectangular wall or rectangular concrete section, like for a beam, and the width of it is gonna be only 12 inch, because don't forget, in this analysis here, we concerned that you are gonna be taking here one foot perpendicular to the screen. So now you are gonna have a section of the wall at the bottom, now I'm thinking here, where's the tension side? Is the tension side going to be on the right or the left? 
Anthony, can you help me with this? Yeah. Now, when I'm pushing the wall this way, where's gonna be the tension sign? Here's the- On the force. right. On the right. And on the left, I'm gonna have tension or compression? Compression. Compression. So where is the best location for a rebar? Vertical rebar, right? To take this force. Should I put it yep. in this side or should I put it in that side? Right. To the right. To the right side. Okay. By the way, this is a very common mistake that I have seen during construction. That I go to a retaining wall, I'm looking at it, and they see the rebars is just put on this side here, the main rebars. Professor, could you wrong. explain why? Uh, one more time. Uh, why the mm -hmm. rebar, I mean, why it would be tension on the right and not the left? Okay, you are pushing this wall that way, right? So you should expect right. that the wall is going to be moving from the top, it's going to be moving this way, right? So the wall is going to be like this. So if I may do the wall, I'm going to say, here's the wall. When I start to do, when I start construction, right? And then after I start to put, let me make it thicker. Right? So here's the wall. And let me make it in this color. Right? Now you start to push the wall. What's going to happen to it? The wall is going to be moving this way, right? Now where's the tension side? Is it to the right of the wall no. or to the left of the wall? To the right. It's going to be to the right of the wall because it's going to be here the tension side. That was Anthony's answer, which is um, completely correct. And in this case, I am expecting to see the rebars on the right side of the wall, which means in the dirt side or in the soil side, if you like. Common mistake. So, so that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the soil, if I'm not mistaken, it's on the right, correct? Yes. This is why the pressure is coming yes. this way. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Like in this case, like you see here, soil is giving this side. So the force is going to be coming that way, right? This soil is pushing the wall. So I'm expecting this wall also when it rotates is going to be doing something like this. So mm -hmm. tension is going to be God. against the soil. So you want to be sure that if you're looking at some reinforcing in some side, whether you are doing the design or just doing the structural observation or maybe some inspection, right? So you want to be sure that it is located on the right side, it is not located in this side. So I have seen wrong designs. Uh, in some cases, I've seen the reinforcing bars that put this location here. I have seen it uh, also in construction that the design is correct, but in construction, they didn't give it really enough attention. And in some cases, they put it right in the middle. I don't the like failure would have occurred middle. near the bottom, correct? Yeah, because this is going to be the maximum moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the moment's going to be like right. this, right? If this is a pressure, mm -hmm. the moment is going to be very similar to it. So I don't want also this to be in the middle. I prefer it to be on that side as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Now, this is here. I'm going to put big sign. It's going to be for reading only. Right? Why for reading? It's gonna be about the stability of the wall. And I said, I don't wanna cover it here in this course. It's gonna be about foundation design, but you need to understand where it's coming from. You need to know that overturning is not good and you need to have good safety factor against overturning and same thing for the sliding. So let me go back and confirm this with you guys. Here's the overturning. When the entire wall is gonna be just rotating about this point. Sliding, which means the entire wall is gonna be just sliding. Now the wall is getting good shape. The wall itself, the concrete member is getting good shape and the footing is getting good, right? In this case. So the integrity of the retaining wall uh, will be confirmed here. But the problem is the entire footing and the entire retaining wall is getting just shifting out. It's getting either falling apart or maybe just sliding. You don't want this to happen, right? And this is getting part of the foundation design that you do. As I said, I'm not gonna be covering this here. So I'm gonna say this is gonna be for reading only. Here is a standard wall. It has a stem, a footing, and this one here, what we call a key. The big force is gonna be coming from this side. I'm gonna call this gonna be the active force or active pressure. And this gonna be the passive pressure as a resistance. In this course, I'm interested in designing this stem. This is gonna be up to here. Now, where's the critical section for the moment? Someone's gonna say, let me just put this here for now. 
So it's gonna say it's gonna be right here when it connects to the footing. Someone else is gonna be right here. What do you guys think? Above the footing or below the footing? Critical section for moment. The point of maximum moment on the wall itself. I think it's going to be on top of top of the footing because, as you, if we assume it as a cantilever beam, yeah, then that top of the going to going to be the face of the support, which is the fixed. This is correct. So I'm going to say this gave you here the critical section for uh, the moment when it comes to design of the wall. How about the reinforcing? Where should I put the reinforcing now? Should I put it here in this side, like this, to the right of the wall, or should I put it to the left of the wall? Right. Not to the right of the wall. Just repeat the question. Just want to confirm that you guys are listening to me. All right, so I'm going to say it's giving this side here. Is it good? Okay. Here is active, yes. Uh, that uh, provisions that if we have the actually the width of the wall is more than ten inches. We have to have on each side. That also applied here or not? Um, it doesn't really apply here. Um, so that for only the bearing bearing walls, you know. The, not this is way. usually going to be for bearing walls for retaining walls. You can get away with it. I'm talking about actual business. Okay. Oh, okay. It's going to be about actual business. You can get away with just putting one layer, put it to one side. But if I'm doing a design and once I go beyond 12 inches, I'm going to put the main reinforcing here and the second reinforcing, I'm going to put it in this side. So what does it mean by main reinforcing? It means if you'd like to put, let's say in your design, I'm just going to throw here numbers just for only secret discussion. I'm going to put here number five, let's say at 12 inch on center, right? or number six, whatever, right? I'm gonna put it in this side. In that side, I may put, I'm gonna put here number five or number four at 18 inch on center. It's gonna be in that side, in that face of the wall. Professor, what kind of clear covers uh, do these retaining walls need? The clear what cover minimum, once you have it to the soil is gonna be three inch. So in this side, it's gonna be three inches. So I'm gonna say here, clear cover to soil is gonna be three inches. If you have it formed to the soil, if you have any form work, use is used. I'm gonna go here with two inches. What do I mean by that? Let me take you back here to some pictures and explain to you what do I mean. In this construction here, this can be prefabricated, which means that was built in some other place. And this surface to the soil is not really poured against the soil. It used to have a formwork and then we have taken the formwork out. In this case, the clear covers can be two inches. In this case, it's going to be two inches. In this case, this is here looks like cast in place. But look at what happened. First, they have four more from inside, soil side, and from outside. So in this case, I'm going to be going here with two inches. In this case, I'm going to go here with two inches. But if you have shut crate wall, you're going to go here with three inches. What's the shut crate? Did you guys hear about shut crate before? No. OK. Shut crate. Do you have a kind of a gun, uh, like a gun for the concrete? So the concrete is going to be thrown at a pressure to the wall. So what they do here, they, they make the soil like a stable or vertical, and then they start to shut from this side. They're going to be shutting the concrete. Have you guys seen a small swimming pool during construction? Yes. Like the swimming pool you have at your house or whatever, right? They do here shut crete. They gun mm -hmm. it. Did you hear about this term before gunited? So the concrete yeah. is going to be coming through a pump and then they have a, a very strong nozzle. It's going to be at least four inch nozzle. And then they shoot the concrete to let's say the wall or to the soil or whatever. So in a case like this, it's going to be treated as cast in place. And you need to have your three inch of cover. 
If you have any formwork before you put the soil, you can go here with two inches. Clear. Okay, here's the pressure. You have the active side, uh, side and the passive side and the edge, the height that you need to use here. In this case, it's gonna be up to this point. Look at this. It's gonna be this section, right? Right above the footing. Someone's gonna say, how about the soil here? And to enter this, we say, we ignore it because it is so easy that at one point, someone's gonna be doing here some maintenance and open a trench and you can lose this piece of the soil, right? So this soil section, you can just lose it easily. And in this case, you're gonna have, this is gonna be the retaining height. It's gonna be from this point to that point. It's gonna be the height that you need to use. And this is gonna be your critical section for the moment on the wall. All right, so let's see here how the soil report is gonna be giving you the soil pressure. It says here, lateral earth pressure, which is a soil pressure on the wall. If you have restrained wall, it's gonna be 55 PCF for level backfill and sloping backfill. You see here two values for level and sloping. So number one, I need to understand the difference between restrained wall and unrestrained wall. Number two, I wanna know what is the level backfill, what is the sloping backfill. So I'm gonna take you back here to one of the beginning slides. I'm gonna say, this is here level backfill. This is not level, this gave you sloping backfill. This here is gave you level backfill. You see the difference? So what do you call this? Sloping backfill, sloping backfill. So the pressure is gonna be slightly hot. Sloping backfill, level backfill or flat backfill, right? This is gonna be here unrestrained top, like cantilever. Same here, same here, same here, same here. This gonna be restrained on the top. Because you have concrete slab, it's gonna be preventing the wall from moving that way, right? So this gear here is gonna be restrained, like in a pavement wall. This also restrained, restrained. This gonna be cantilever, cantilever, or unrestrained, unrestrained, right? This gonna be sloped, level back from, level back from. This gonna be also sloped back from. So now we understand the difference between uh, the two terms, right? You can say here, we understand what is restrained, what is unrestrained. We understand level versus sloping background. Okay, this is information given to you in the source report, which is very standard, which also you should expect it in the final. I'm gonna give you something very similar to this, but just different values. Here's the wall given to you. Is this restrained or unrestrained? Unrestrained. Unrestrained, so it's gonna be cantilever. So I need to go with this one. I'm gonna be going with this box, right? For the pressure. Is this level or sloping? See, this is level. Level, right? So which pressure should I use in this case? I'm gonna say I'm gonna be using here 35 pump per cubic foot. Let's give you this guy here, right? Let's give you my choice for the pressure. Based on this soil report, they say when you have unrestrained wall like can lever, and it's gonna be level backfill, use 35 pump per cubic foot. Now let's see here from that point to the end of the problem, what steps I need to do to figure out the amount of reinforcing that I need to put in the wall. Do you have the wall thickness or you need to find it out? Do you guys have the wall thickness? Yes. Okay, good. One, right. So you have the wall thickness. We have also more information about the wall here. We have explanation, what does it mean by unrestrained versus restrained, right? It's okay. We have also the soil unit weight. Not very critical to me. We have also the coefficient of friction. We have the passive pressure, okay? All of this is good to do the footing design as in terms of overturning and sliding. Not interested in this. I'm interested in just the wall design, which is this piece here, right? This is what I'm interested in. How much is the retained height? So I'm gonna say, what do you mean by retained height? I'm gonna say difference in elevation between the top of the soil and this bottom of the soil. You say 10 feet, right? To give you the height edge that I need to use. It says also concrete strength is giving 2,500 PSI. Rebars is giving grade 60. The vertical rebars would have three inch clear is giving number five. So I mean, at least I know what rebar size and I know how much is a clear cover on the concrete wall for the rebars. Also, I need to know where to put the rebars. Now again, should I put the rebar here or should I put it here? Which position? One or two? This is gonna be one to the right, two to the left. One. So I'm gonna put it here. 
here's the pressure at the bottom. You see, I didn't go all the way to the bottom of the footing. I just take the section to be right here at the interface between the concrete wall to the footing. I said the pressure here is gonna be 35 pump per cubic foot times 10 feet. This pressure at the bottom, 350 pump per square foot. I can put it also in case. How about the force? You remember the force is gonna be the integration or the volume of this triangular distribution, meaning is gonna be equal to the height, 10 feet, multiplied by 350, divided by two. Here it is. This gonna be the pressure, 350 or 0.35 times 10 feet, multiplied by one half. So, okay, this gave me 1.75 kip. This gave me also per foot because I have considered here a strip of one foot of this footing perpendicular to the screen. How about the moment? I'm gonna see the moment is gonna be equal to that force, the 175 multiplied by this moment arm. How much is this moment arm? It's gonna be one third of this edge. How much is this one third of this edge? It's gonna be 3.33. So the distance from this point the force to the top of the concrete footing is going to be equal to one third of this edge. So we're going to say you can take this divided by three for what? For the location of the force. You see this box here or this value is the value that you need to use in this analysis for this force. All right, we're good. Yeah. All right. So here's the moment. Moment is going to be equal to 5.83. Now, is this again dead load? No. Is it life load? No. It is edge load. And what is the factor for the edge load? If you look here at uh, the soil pressure, it's going to be equal to 1.6. So the soil factor or the load factor is going to be equal to 1.6. Very similar to the life load. You know, when you say 1.2 dead plus 1.6 life, also when you have edge, H is gonna be this soil pressure, use a factor of 1.6. So you can say this gave you the load factor from the load combination. So again, we start by M at the service level, 5.83. We need to multiply by 1.6 to get it at the ultimate level. Now it's gonna be become 9.3. Is it okay? Here is H, it's gonna be 12 inch. This is not the same as this edge, right? This edge with the height of the wall. Now, if you need to design this section, you need to find out the depth of the section, right? The depth D is gonna be equal to nine inches, roughly, let's say nine inches. Someone's gonna say this gonna be here clear cover. You can say yes, which means you'd like here to deduct one half of this. How much is one half of number five? Can someone help me? One half of the diameter of number five is how much? Or how much is this DB? Yes? It's gonna be 560. Right, so one half is gonna be 516 of an inch, almost quarter of an inch. That's why I just ignored it here. If you're talking about quarter of an inch, I'll ignore it. Half inch, I'll consider it in the analysis, just so you guys know. So I consider the depth to be nine inches. Now, where is the depth here is gonna be? I'm gonna say the rebar is gonna be here, right? It's gonna be the tension side. And the depth is gonna be from here to there. This gonna be the depth, right? So I'm gonna say this is gonna be your depth D. Okay. Now let's look here at the reinforcing design. Have you guys seen this before? Just wondering. Yeah, it says here consider number five at 16. I'm just gonna be throwing a number there and double check it. Here's the reinforcing bars, right? When you have number five, it's gonna be 0.31 for one rebar. You multiply this by 12, which means the width, right? The one foot width divide by 16 for the spacing. This gave me the amount of rebars that you provided in 12 inches strip. Find out A, you guys have seen this before. Find out C, confirm the fee factor, right? And then find out fee min. Fee min here is how much? 8.88. This is not good, right? So my assumption was not really good. So I need to add more rebars. 
they say here a stay was number five, right? I cannot change the rebar size. So instead, I'm going to reduce the spacing. When you make the spacing less, this AS is going to be growing up. So for example, instead of going to 16 inch, I can go here to maybe 14 inch. You see what happened? I just changed here to 14 inch. Look at the reinforcing. It used to be 0.23 square inches per foot. Now it becomes 0.26. Now let's look here at the end. How much is we meant? 9.68. So all of the steps, you guys now, you should be experts in this, right? That's why I'm just flying through it. And look at the demand. Demand is 9.3, capacity is 9.68. This is gonna be a good design. So the amount of reinforcement bars needed is gonna be number five at 14. Any questions? Now, this is gonna be in your exam, right? Professor? Yeah. Uh, could you explain why you divided the, the rebar by two? Where is the same? Where did oh, they divide by two? The number five, you divided the, the diameter by two. Where? In here in this slide? For the AS, uh, you got 0 0.31. Yeah. yeah. I did yeah. not divide by two. Where is two? Or how'd you get the 0 0.31? 0 0.31? Yeah. From the table. You have the steel table, the reinforcing table. Uh, if you give me a second. Good question. Good question. I put it here for you. You remember this table? Number five, look at this. Number five, how much is the cross section area of number five? Okay, yeah. 0.31. Any questions? Yes? Excuse me, uh, for the spacing. Yes. Of those, uh, Provisions from the code which we used in bearing walls is going to be applied here? Yes, or? yes, which means three times. Yes, 18 inch and three times. This is correct for the spacing. This is correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And also that minimum, minimum reinforcement, everything is going to be the same. Huh? Minimum reinforcement, I'd say go with the gravity wall. It's going to be yes. Yes, this is not a shear wall. I know. So yes. everything that applies for the gravity is going to apply for retaining. Motion. You should. Yes, you should. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Professor, could you explain uh, what D uh, means in the picture? The nine the inches? Yeah. Like, what, what does that represent? Okay. Um, absolutely. Give me a second. Give me a second. You remember this slide set? It's number three. You remember this depth, D? So this is H, this is a section of the wall. And this width that I've considered here is gonna be only 12 inches. Look at this. This is gonna be 12 inches here perpendicular. So this section, right, you see where the rebar is at? So this section actually, as if we're looking from this side, look, we're looking from this side. And this section, you need to rotate here 90 degrees to understand it. So the vertical rebars is going to be here, right? And H is going to be equal to one foot, which is this edge. And D is going to be equal to one foot, 12 inches minus three inch for the cover. So this cover is going to be equal to three inches, this little piece. Oh, okay, so it's just rotated? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to be the vertical rebars is going to be in this side. And the total depth of the wall or thickness is gonna be a foot, right? This gives you the foot from here to there. You see that? Yeah. yeah. And the depth is gonna be the distance. If you look carefully at this, depth is gonna be the distance from the rebar to, you see this? The depth is gonna be the distance from the rebar to the compression fibers. From the rebar to the compression fibers. Okay, thank you. No problem. Excuse me again, yeah. for the spacing, if we go with that provision, then at least it's going to be have to have 18 inches on center. It's going to be one and a half. It's going to be maximum. Not. Oh, that's the maximum? The, oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, the spacing, that when the spacing is one and a half or three times or whatever, it's going to be the maximum spacing, which means we would like you to put a little bit more rebars. Oh, so you that, need to reduce the spacing. That 3H is actually going to be the maximum. 
No, 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 3H. 3 times H, yes, yes. That's gonna be the, the actually lesser of 3H and 18 inches is gonna yes. be the maximum spacing. Maximum spacing, this is correct, okay. not the minimum spacing. Okay. This is correct. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, no problem. Okay, after that, we have the shear walls. Um, what happens here in shear walls? Shear walls are used to resist seismic forces. So here's a plan of a building, schematic building. And um, if you like to put shear walls, usually you put it in the inside of the building. You don't put it in the perimeter. Because in the perimeter of the building, you'd like to have windows, right? So if you put this out here, you're gonna be taking the chance of putting a nice window and a view, right? So maybe you'd like to have it in the middle, as you see here. Um, in some cases also, you can put the shear walls in the perimeter this way, and then you give a chance to put some windows. Look at this, some windows here. Or in uh, here, professor, you put in the middle, yes. Uh, with that top method, is that how you kind of have like a spandrel glass uh, exterior? Yeah, so you can have exterior glass, right? So it depends on the design. But let's say that we have a building here. Here's a schematic building. It's not an actual building. It's just a building that I did here just to explain on it, right? To clarify what we are doing. When you have the forces coming in the exit, just like plan view, right? So seismic forces or earthquake forces can be pushing the building to the right or to the left. It's gonna be pushing the building this way. And at certain points, you'll have a method or a mean to do the calculation for Vx or Vy. What is Vx? It's giving the force in the x direction, and it's giving the force in the y direction. The wall is going to be strong in the in-plane direction, which means this wall here is going to be supporting this and this, SW1, SW2, SW stands for shear wall 1 and shear wall 2. It's going to be resisting the force in the x direction. If the force is coming in the y direction, it's going to be SW3, SW4, and SW5. It's going to be resisting the force in the y direction. So just explain what is the relationship between the force and the shear wall. You can have also moment frames. You see here a moment frame, like a frame. You know a frame, right? Like two columns and a beam, and we call this moment frame, MF1, MF2. So in our case here, in the X direction, what is resisting the shear force? This X force. You say moment frame one, moment frame two, is W1, is W3. How about when the force is coming the Y direction? I'm gonna say it's gonna be MF moment frame three, moment frame four which means shear wall one and shear wall two, they are not resisting the force when it comes in the y direction. I just want to be sure that you guys understand this. So usually a moon frame or a shear wall, they resist the force in its direction, not in the other direction. So again, Vx, which means the shear in the x direction, is gonna be resisted by this guy, this guy, this guy, and this moon frame too. For the force in the y, it's gonna be only these two moon frames not any of that. Now let's see what the code says about this. Code says about certain amount of reinforcing that you need to provide there, right? They say once the shear demand, which means a factor shear force, factor means what? Ultimate. Once you go beyond a certain limit, beyond this certain capacity, right? You need to use two curtains of wall reinforcement. What does it mean by two curtains? It means two layers of reinforcing. So, okay, I guess I'm gonna be adding this to the 10 inch thing. You know, once you go up of 10 inch, you need to provide two layers. It's gonna be the same thing, but this is gonna be added when you have a shear wall. Also, for the vertical reinforcement, when you have a shear wall, your minimum is gonna be just one value for the vertical and horizontal, it's gonna be 0 0.0025. Now I'm not gonna be using the other table. If you recall the other table, it has different values. I'm gonna say, well, I cannot really use it, right? I'm gonna be using just 0 0.0025. We have a couple of details here just to show you how the shear walls get be detailed and reinforced. You're gonna have some reinforcing in both direction, as it says here, each way, each face. So vertical, horizontal, let's give you number six at 16. And then at the end, you're gonna have lots of rebars, similar to a column. And the wall thickness usually indicated here, and here's the footing. It's just explanation so that you know 
uh, what drawings usually are submitted, let's say for construction in this case. And here's the end reinforcement for the jam, we call the jam reinforcement, like for the end, the boundary of the wall. And the reason that we have this confinement, you guys know what the confinement is doing to concrete, right? Increases the strength of the concrete and also increases the strain capacity of the wall. So this is the reason that we have at the end of the wall. It's giving both sides, eight number eight, eight number eight. If you look here, you have A3 bars, it's gonna be eight number eight. So, okay. Now I have an idea about the wall, how it's gonna be detailed. Now it says here, row minimum is gonna be equal to how much? 0 0.0025. This gives you now the conclusion, right? Out of this ACI uh, document. Maximum spacing. This is gonna be the maximum spacing that we were just talking about, right, Roman? Maximum spacing is gonna be 18 inch. Also, you need to have two layers. What, when do you think this is gonna happen? is going to be happening when V sub U, the shear, is going to be higher than this value here. This is going to be on the top of the 10 inch thick requirement. Once you go above 10 inch, of course, you're going to have two layers. So all of this is going to be above and beyond what you have learned in the gravity wall. And then they say there's more than one thing. It says here, you need to provide 90 degree standard hook or 100 degree hook. You remember the hook of the bar? once you have a shear demand, which is gonna be more than this value here. So what my degree hook, what 180 degree hook, can I take you back? I'm gonna say this hook, you see this rebar, horizontal rebar, and this is gonna be the hook that I'm talking about, this one here, see this one? This is gonna be nine degree, standard hook. Is this going to be only here? I'm going to say no. It's going to be for both reinforcing bars coming as horizontal rebars. And also this guy, you see this one that I'm pointing at? It's going to be for this one. So here's our horizontal rebars. You need to bring them inside this confined area and then hook them inside it. This is what it says here. This gives you the 90 degree center hook for all the whole reinforcement in the jam area. What jam area? This gives you the jam area because we call this jam bar. Is it fine? How about the strength of the wall? You guys remember in the shear design of walls and beams? We have done shear design of beams. Am I correct? Yes? No, just we just check. Yeah, which is shear design. We call it shear design. It's going to be right here, isn't it here? No. This is an older slide set, number seven. And then we have done this load combination and just, you know, I'm showing here the edge. See, here's the edge. Now it's gonna be a good chance to show this, right? It's gonna be for soil pressure. And where is the soil pressure? Definition of edge, earth pressure, you see this? Just confirm that's for the retaining wall, right? Here's the shear strength of the beam. We said that we have component from the concrete and component from the steel. Here's the wall component, right? The concrete component, correct? And the factor we use is gonna be two square root of F prime C times the shear area. For the steel, we're gonna have different equation. And here's the equation, right? This is what you have done here for the beam. Now let's see the wall. The wall is gonna be very similar to it, but instead of having the concrete and the steel, we have one equation. But you know what? One of them is gonna be one component for the concrete, right? And the other one is gonna be one component for the steel. That's why it says F sub Y. So, okay. So VN, it needs to have a fee factor here. So the fee factor, let's say we're gonna be taking it at 0.6. I'm gonna, it is not shown here, but you're gonna see it very soon. It's gonna be 0.6. The fee factor for shear wall design, we just take it at 0.6. In beams, we used to have a factor of how much for the concrete? Two, how about the punch and shear? What is the average factor for the shear? Anyone recalls? Punch and shear? No one recalls it? You remember it or no? I'm just trying to look for it. You know, for punching shear, you guys recall the that equation? Factor? 
Yeah, what was the factor, the shear factor? Four. Four, look at this, it's gonna be shear factor multiplied by square root of F prime C times C factor. So I said, okay, how about here for beams, it was equal to two for punch and shear. And also sometimes you call this two way shear, it's gonna be equal to four. I'm gonna say, how about for shear walls? I'm gonna say it's gonna be equal to alpha C. I said, okay, now this is, this gave you like a variable. And they said, this alpha C is gonna be equal to three when, and you see this, Wall height to wall length, wall height to wall length. So I'm gonna be using this graph for it. Based on the wall height to the wall length, you're gonna have a different factor for alpha sub C. When it is becoming like two, like in this region, the wall works like a beam, you know, like the regular beam and can go up a little bit all the way to three. When do you think this is gonna happen? When the wall is gonna be getting shorter. How do I know this? Look at this factor, H divided by L. What is H? I'm gonna say H is giving you the wall height, right? L is giving you the wall length. So when H over L is gonna be small, what's gonna happen when this height is gonna be smaller than this length by a lot? You're gonna be at a factor of three. The wall is gonna be getting stronger in here. But once the wall height is gonna go, is gonna be grown up to be more than two times the wall length, which means if the wall height here is gonna be more than two times the wall length. What's gonna happen? It's gonna be acting like a beam. To this alpha sub C, right? It's gonna be based on the wall height to the wall length. The code gives you here a couple of equations. I put them in this graph. Questions? All right. So I said, okay, good. So I understand this alpha C understands square root of F prime C. What is this ACV? I say it's gonna be the cross section area of the wall resisting the shear. So which section do you think we're gonna be resisting the shear? Let me go here to this picture. I'm gonna say the section resisting the shear is gonna be equal to, if I cut here a section through the wall and look down, it's gonna be this section here. It's gonna be equal to the wall thickness, 12 inch, multiplied by the wall length. So you can see here the cross section area, ACV equals thickness of the wall multiplied by length of the wall. Let's give you this section here that you're cutting through the wall, looking down. Because the shear force acting on the wall is gonna be coming this way and also from this level is gonna be coming that way. So when you take this total shear, you put it on the wall and this gives you the section resisting uh, the shear. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be equal to what again? ECV. I can just throw it here, right? It's gonna be equal to thickness of the wall times the length of the wall. So now I'm, I understand this, understand this, understand this. I know F sub Y is gonna be only rho sub N. What is rho sub N? It's gonna be the horizontal reinforcement ratio, which means the reinforcing that is really resisting the shear is gonna be this reinforcing here, this three bars, because it's gonna be parallel to the shear force, right? The vertical is resisting vertical loads, but mainly the shear is gonna be resisted by this horizontal reverse, okay? How can you figure out this reinforcement ratio? I'm gonna say, well, we have seen reinforcement ratio before, and all what we need is gonna be one example to explain how this is gonna get done. And this gonna be an example one. I'm gonna stop here at this point and ask you guys if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in the... Uh, office hour in a minute from now. All right, uh, if you like, please go ahead and uh, sign up. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, I wasn't sure if you marked me down. I stepped away from my computer before I logged in for yes, attendance. Okay, not a problem. Alexis, and one. yes. Mm. Okay, I put you in. All right, thank you. Okay. Have a good rest of your day. Also, uh, Dan Daniel, I think you marked up absent, and I, and I had said here. I don't know if you heard me. No, I did not, but here we go. Anyone else? Alan Bon, Jamie, Alexander, Omar, Dylan. Okay. Should be good then. All right, you guys have a good night.
Professor, you'll be in your office hours like around seven, right? Uh, why seven? Because I have class right now. What? I have class. Okay. Um, um, I'll, I'll see if I'm around. Yes, try me. I, I, I'll do my best to be here. Well, it's like at 6.45, so I'll try to see if we get out okay. early. Okay. okay. I'm going to leave it on. All right. Thanks.